You know, when you're working the dream, the struggle is oh so real. You have to be determined. You have to work hard. You need to be compassionate. Set goals and be timely. Stay focused and reach high. You need all this and the Lord to come together to make you a better person while you're working the dream. Hi, welcome to Working the Dream. I'm your host, Derek Kelly, and today we're going to share tips on how your performance can pave the way to further career success. Years ago, I was blessed to learn from a mentor from Atlanta, Georgia, the unwritten rules of career success. Now, the acronym for the unwritten rules of success that we're going to share is PIES, P-I-E-S. Please don't get these confused with the kind that we demolish at Thanksgiving. But these are going to be the kind that ensure that at work, we are successful. Let me share what PI stands for. The first letter is for P, performance. We must be known as good performers. The second letter is for image. And that image, does it match the image of the organization that you're working for? The third letter is E, exposure. How many people know you and how many people know you positively? And the last letter is S for spirituality. The other letters don't matter if you don't have that one. Okay, let's look at it. Excellent performance is the price of entry in today's workplace. Now, here's the funny thing. People say price of entry, yes. Unless you are a good performer, you'll get fired. Because companies only want to pay for people that get the job done. They only want good performers. So, how do I get there? Well, great performance starts with picking a field that you want to work in and picking something that you will enjoy doing for a long time. You see, if you are just doing something for the money, you probably will not be nearly as engaged as if you were in a profession that you have a passion for. Let me share a story that illustrates what I mean. Several years ago, there were some students that complained to the leaders of their universities that something was wrong with their education. You see, these students had chosen fields of study based on what they thought those positions in those fields would pay when they graduated. I mean, they went to the internet and they put in the position they were studying to have. And they looked at the pay grades and they said, ha ha, these jobs are gonna be at the very top of the pay grade. Now, here's reality. Four or five years later, the work landscape was nothing similar to what they had started. In fact, some of the jobs had been sent overseas. Some of the jobs had been completely changed or eliminated due to technology. Imagine a typewriter repair specialist now versus 50 years ago. I mean, technology changes so fast, what you think is gonna happen, it may be gone. So at the end of these student studies, the job markets had changed so drastically that they were no longer going to be in the top paid professions. Now, let's not feel sorry for them. They got their degrees, they were educated, and they were gonna have some pretty good, well-paying jobs. But the moral of the story is to enjoy what you do, pick a field that you are truly going to enjoy working in, and your passion is going to come out of your performance. There's nothing worse to running into somebody at work and they say, they don't pay me enough money to do this job. So, let's look in on our friend Ron and determine how his performance might be viewed by his upper management team. Oh, hey, Miss Green. Hey, Ron. I need the revenue projections for next quarter for all business segments. How quickly can I get them? I can have them for you in five minutes if you need me to. Now, did you want those with the Hillsdale account on there or without? Since that contract is still pending, it could greatly affect our revenue and run rates. 
So I took the liberty of creating both scenarios. Oh, good work. Yeah, I, I'd like to take a good look at both of them, and I think Mr. Martin would appreciate analyzing the impact of the accounts on the company. So, yeah, good work. Uh, thanks. Like no that. problem. Oh, Miss Green, do you want those in the spiral bindings? I can run down to office support and have them do it for you. Ron, you think of everything, don't you? That's a good idea. Excellent job. Good. Did you notice how Ron was proactive as he talked about what was expected? He asked questions to ensure that he did what would satisfy Mrs. Green. Do you notice that he made sure that whatever it is she wanted, he had a clear expectation in his mind before he took off? You see, he understands if Miss Green is happy and if he delivers, he gets that big gold star. And by the way, big gold star performances, <laughs> they create manager comfort when assigning bigger and better and more important projects to employees. The more important the project, the more value that you have as an employee. Now in contrast, let's look in on Kim and see how she's handling her work assignments. Girl, I didn't finish the episode though, I fell asleep. Anyway, finish telling me about this date you were on. No way. Who takes a girl out on a romantic dinner to a fast food restaurant? That's just craziness. Oh, hey, I gotta go. The evil ice queen is on her way. Bye. Good afternoon, Kim. Hi, Miss Green. I love those shoes. They really complement your outfit well. Thanks. You were supposed to get the Winkler supplemental report to me? Yes, I'm still working on it. What's the holdup? Is it systems? Have people been too slow in getting you the information? I, uh... Look, it was due last Friday. This is the fourth Wednesday of the month. You know that every fourth Thursday, we have an executive team meeting about this project. I need that report. I know, Miss Green, I'm so sorry. And you know what, I'm, I'm working on it. And it's just that with the special projects and the quarterly reports all due at the same time, it's... This is an opportunity for you to shine and get recognized by the executives, Kim. I know, Miss Green. You know what, I'll have it for you by tomorrow morning. No, I need it tonight. Before you go home, I need that report. So, you, you may stay late. Okay, Miss Green, I understand. Thanks, dear. Thanks, dear. Wow, I'm sure you're gonna agree with me. Kim's future is about as secure as a germ at a Lysol convention. Her boss has no confidence in her whatsoever, and she's so disingenuous when she's talking to her boss. I'm pretty sure Ms. Green, she, she's not feeling good about her work performance. You see, in performance, there's only one answer that's ever acceptable, and it is, yes, I got it done. Performance is expected. Now, we are fans of performers. Just a few weeks ago, I got sucked into an argument of who was the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. Michael Jordan versus LeBron James. And we argued and we argued performance stats. And we talked about who did what, when, and what years they did it. Well, they were all younger than me, and I sprung the Dr. J answer on them, and they had no idea who I was talking about. But here's the reality, whether it's sports, football, basketball, golf, hockey, soccer, doesn't matter, we only talk about performers, the best form performers. Sports performers who cannot perform are dismissed from the team. It's the same in the workplace. Your performance is going to be proportionate to your ability to get other people to cooperate and work with you. Now, I was at an office one time doing my little consulting work, and I walked past an area where people were walking and talking and working. So I watched a supervisor take some work over to a worker, but it seemed like the supervisor was a little afraid to go there. In fact, I actually heard the employee say, 
I know you're not trying to give me more work, are you? Hmm, I thought to myself. Uh, the supervisor can only give you work, hmm, at work, which we go to work so that we can work and we get paid for working. So yeah, of course, the supervisor is bringing you more work. Where else would she bring you work? At home? Now I thought about this person and wondered, I wonder how they're viewed, and I'm pretty sure I don't have to wonder how they're viewed in the workplace. They're not really ready to perform. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab a pen and paper, and I want you to take a performance quiz. And if you have somebody that knows you really well, have them around also, because I would like for them to help you give uh, the right answers. Now, if you're ready, here we go. Okay, true or false, are you ready? Good. Question number one. My assignments are completed on a timely basis. Question number two. I am always seeking to expand my skills. Question number three. I belong to a professional organization or group that supports my career goals. Question number four. I present solutions to my boss, teacher, or professor instead of problems. Number five, I take on new projects, new responsibility without hesitation. Six, I work hard to make my boss look good. Seven, my work is neat, clear, and thorough, usually more than what is required. Eight, I'm willing to sign my name to any work I complete. Nine, I am continually seeking new challenges. And the final question, I readily assist my peers even when not asked. Now, some of you might say, does this make a difference? Let's look at the first question. My assignments are completed on a timely basis. Now, let's look at what happens when the answer is no. I was in an office working with a client and the director came out of the office and he said, tomorrow I have a meeting with the vice president. Very important meeting. But he had asked all of his direct reports for their smaller reports so that he could get ready to have his meeting with the vice president. Well, only two out of six people had their reports in on time. So he stormed down the hall, brow was furrowed, he walked into their office, he says, where's that report? And people came up and said, oh, I, I forgot to get it to you. And they quickly scurried to do something. He went to the next one, oh, I forget it, forgot to get it to you. He went to the next office, I forgot to get it to you. Four times. On the way back, he passes me, he said, I need to fire them. Now, if your assignments are completed on a timely basis, your boss has confidence that when they give you something, it will be done when it needs to be done. So imagine when it's time to get a new assignment or a, a, an assignment that has a lot of visibility, would you give it to the ones who are late or would you give it to the person that gets their stuff in on time? Second question, I am always seeking to expand my skills. Whether we like it or not, the world is changing and new things are coming out all the time. If you were a software expert 20 years ago, I don't even know if we use any of the same stuff we used 20 years ago. So how am I going to stay on top of my profession if I'm not seeking to expand my skills and learn new things? By the way, I've talked to people who said, I just want to do my job and go home and nobody bother me. Please wake up not going to happen. See, the reason your skills need to expand is because the people that are coming up the organization have bigger and greater skills. And sometimes just to stay comfortably where you are, you need to be in the habit of expanding your skills and your abilities. Question number three. I belong to a professional organization or group that supports my career goals. Now, Here's why that's important. Let's say you are an up and coming accountant and you join a professional accounting organization. Think about the benefits of the networking. 
there are going to be accountants there that have far more experience than you. So you're going to be able to ask questions and get answers that you may not be able to figure out on your own. You're going to be at meetings where maybe there's a new software package that comes out and all of the accountants in your area are talking about it. In this group, in this organization, you're going to have access to information and that is going to make an incredible difference to your career. Number four, I present solutions instead of problems to my boss, teacher, or professor. Now, there are going to be problems in the workplace, but I had a pet peeve as a manager when someone would come into the office and say, hey boss, you have a problem, and kind of plop it on my desk. I was like, do I have a problem or do we have a problem? Are you a member of this team? You see, if you walk into the boss's office, the teacher's office, whoever the authority figure is, and all you do is present problems, <laughs> you are a problem. However, if you walk in with this technique, here it goes. Boss, we have a problem. The problem is A, B, C, but I believe I have a solution. It's D, E, F. What do you think? At that point, you are no longer just a bringer of a problem, you are also the problem solver. And if you ever want to be perceived as an incredible performer, be known as a problem solver, that's the greatest reputation you could have at work. Number five, I take on new projects, new responsibilities without hesitation. Now this one might kill people if they're lazy simply because at work, you're going to get new responsibilities. You're going to get new projects. And supervisors and bosses that we work for, they want to feel comfortable with giving us those projects. They want to make sure that we're willing, we're able, and we do it without hesitation. Why should they have to beg us to take on new projects and new responsibilities? In fact, let's say that you're skilled at making your supervisor take that project or responsibility to somebody else. Guess who gets the visibility when the project is done? That person. Long term, that person is who's valued. So I want to make sure that if my supervisor needs me to do absolutely anything, if it's within my skill set, I'm going to do it without hesitation. Now, question number six. This was a little difficult uh, for me to handle for a while. Question number six simply says, I work hard to make my boss look good. The first time I met my mentor, we went into a session, a training session, and he was an incredible leader, an incredible communicator, and he had uh, 12, 15 of us young professionals, and we believed we were going to be upwardly mobile. He said, gentlemen, what is your purpose at work? Well, we started coming up with all sorts of answers. My purpose is to bring new ideas. And someone else said, my purpose is to bring my creativity and my problem solving skills. And each answer was more outlandish than the next. And each time someone gave an answer in his calm way, he would simply say, no, sir, that's not it. Well, at the end of all these answers, which went from the ridiculous to the sublime, he simply said, Gentlemen, you have one purpose at work, and that's to make your boss look good. What? Our sole purpose is to make our boss look good. Well, here is the rationale, and it makes so much sense, and after all these years, I will tell you, it is true. The workplace is built on hierarchies. There's a CEO, above him there's the chairman of the board, Below the CEO, there are vice presidents, then there are directors and senior managers and managers and so forth. And everybody that's in that pyramid is looking to do well so they can move up. So anybody that works for them, that makes them look good, becomes an asset that they value. So if I work hard to make my boss look good, who's valued? In fact, if they have to make a choice during a merger or a downsizing, who do you think we should keep? And the list of people includes someone that makes them look good. Human nature, tell me what do you think, uh, what do you think their choice is going to be? Question number seven. My work is neat, clear, and thorough, usually more than what is required. Now, it's the last part that throws folks. A lot of folks can be relatively neat and clear. 
But when you are giving more than what is required, you are a standout employee. Because most employees, they probably aren't going to do that. Now remember, whatever work you turn into your boss, they may be moving that upstairs to their boss. So the better your work product is, the better their work is. And that's, again, something that they praise and pride in a valued employee. Question number eight. I am willing to sign my name to any work I complete. When things are thrown together and just, you know, hodgepodge and just a mess, do you really want to sign your name to it? Because when you sign your name to it, that's how you are going to be viewed. Number nine, I am continually seeking new challenges. There's no such thing as treading water in a career. Either you're getting better and you're learning more, or you're getting passed by everyone else. Look for new challenges daily. God wants us to grow. And 10 is I readily assist my peers even when not asked. Now, when I think about that, wouldn't Christ want us to help the people around us? So it's not just a business principle. This one uh, kind of comes from a higher power. Now, does it make a difference? Well, let's, uh, let's see. Business Analytics, Cynthia Green speaking. Hi, Ms. Green. Jonas here. How are you? Oh, hi, Mr. Martin. What can I do for you? Well, I'm calling you because I've got a very special project I'm going to need your help on. Uh, we've got something we're doing here, and your group has always done a very nice job for us. Your graphics are good. Your analytics are great, and that's what I need on this particular project. Uh, I think it's going to, be about, going to be about two weeks, highly visible, so I'm going to need somebody that um, I can really count on. Do you have anybody like that? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I do, and I think you'll really enjoy working with them. Great, great. I'll call you back with the details, and then we'll get together and set up a meeting, all right? Oh, sounds good. Thanks. Excellent. Bye-bye. Now, to win in the workplace, you must have a reputation of being a strong performer. It's not only what our employers are looking for, it is what God expects of us. We're His hands. We're Him in the workplace. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do it all to the glory of God. Years ago, there was a good friend of mine uh, that I used to play basketball with. And... Uh, it was quite a long time ago. And he translated that a bit differently. We'd be at a pickup game at the park or at the gym or wherever we were, and we'd come in to get dressed and we're putting on our shoes and, and our gear and whatever. And the guys that we were going to play against, uh, they would start to uh, share with us why it was futile that we even showed up that day. They would tell us about all their superior skills, alleged superior skills, and um, they basically said, uh, you guys are no competition. There's no reason for you to even be here. Uh, but when you think about performance, it's not just talking about performance. You actually have to perform. My buddy would simply say, gentlemen, you got to bring some to get some. In fact, I heard sportscasters put it a different way. We talk about what's going to happen in the Super Bowl or what's going to happen in the championship game. And, and we're always guessing and the pundits are saying, we think this is going to happen. We think that's going to happen. But actually, we have no idea until it actually happens. I heard a sportscaster say, uh, folks, the reason why this game didn't turn out the way we thought it was is because you actually have to play it. As far as performance is concerned, you can have all the education, you can have all the skill, you can have all the talent, but you've actually got to play the game. We love performers. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but the Olympics they turned me on to something that I only watch once every four years, swimming and gymnastics. 
But the Olympics has given me new household names that I didn't have before the events. I'm watching swimming and these guys jump into the water and they are stroking and they're pulling and they're giving everything that they have. And when they finally touch the other end and the buzzer goes off and the flag goes up and there were winners, I'm cheering, but I'm cheering their performance. I was watching gymnastics and I'm watching these young ladies go through the air and do things with their bodies that are absolutely unbelievable. But at the end, as they stand on the podium and they get their medals, I'm cheering for their performance. Now, when we're at the workplace, it's the same thing. When I wrote a resume, I wrote on my resume, I am a performer. Hey, they even called me for an interview. And during the interview, I went into the office and I told them, I am a performer. And then on my first day, I was dressed up, I walked in and I said, yes, absolutely, I can prove that I am a performer. So if I am a performer, I must bring some to get some. Remember, you are powerless over what they can do to you, but they are powerless over what God will do for you. Until next time, I'm Eric Kelly. You keep working the dream and the dream will keep working for you. Thank you.